Jenny. Um, as we have a quorum present, I declare this meeting of the committee open. Uh, please note that an audio and visual recording is being taken of this meeting. Uh, this means that your presence at and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed, or published publicly by the transferring outside of Australia. Acknowledges that we are meeting on the traditional country of the Kaurna people of the Adelaide Plains, and we pay respect to their elders past, present, and emerging. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship with the land. We acknowledge they are of continuing importance to the Kaurna people living today. And we also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present with us. Um, I have uh, an apology from uh, Councillor Moran, um, and I note that uh, Councillor Ho um, will be 10 minutes later. Um, uh, Jenny, I've just got an old one in front of me. We're not confirming any minutes here, are we? No, we're not, Deputy Lord Mayor. No, all right. Good o. Okay, we go to the only item, which is a workshop item on the budget and pass to the Deputy CEO, Claire Mockler. Did you need a hand unmuting Claire? Let me just... No, oh. Okay, great. Awesome. So thank you members. Um, so there was a quite a chunky detailed um, set of slides um, that were distributed to you um, at the end of last week. I'm not proposing that we go through it all in a um, huge amount of detail, but I'll be pausing at certain points um, through the session just to check whether there's any questions and just hand back to the chair to um, facilitate that. Um, we'll be driving the slides from our end here so we're just trying to work out the share screen um have we got that worked out i'll leave alex try and sort that out i'll keep talking um so we started working with you back in december on um what the 2020 2021 business plan and budget could start to look like and um you know since that time um, we've been obviously working closely with you taking on board council member feedback um, just around how we present information and the type of content that members have been looking for obviously since march we've been engaging you in quite intensive and detailed conversations around our uh, financial position um, and sitting alongside this we've been doing a lot of work on our long-term financial plan um, and that does enable us to test some scenarios and actions. And I mentioned a couple of times that we would want to take the opportunity to uh, provide you with a with a demonstration of the capability. So in the in your deck tonight, there are just three scenarios there. Obviously, there's multiple different scenarios that could eventuate, but um, I'll be asking Nicole later just to show you how um, we can use um, the long-term financial plan now to be able to better uh, demonstrate the impact of your financial decisions. Um, so uh, last time we met on the 28th of May, we went through our recovery principles and um, tested some ideas and suggestions with you in relation to rates, fees and charges, councils, um, borrowing capacity, as well as the budget and the reset, the infrastructure program, and how we make sure that the city's recovery um, is uh, focused upon and done in a financially sustainability and a financially sustainable manner. Um, so the draft budget we're presenting with you tonight reflects a lot of the input um, that members have provided us to date. Um, and it also incorporates your decision, uh, decision back on the 27th of April that the CEO outline options on how council can achieve a $20 million reduction in operating expenditure during the 2020-2021 financial year. Um, and this comes with an um, initial estimate of associated potential um, costs um, based on um, the um, process that we work you through. We were hoping to do that by the end of June, but due to some calendar challenges, we'll be working with you um, hopefully in early July. What we'd like to do is a three hour workshop, take you through a framework to help guide how council members might make these decisions. Um, and um, as soon as we have some dates and timings, obviously we'll lock those in your diaries. 
um, it's really important that um, in the context of the recovery principles that our service delivery does reflect the needs of the community and as part of the consultation that we'll do on the budget um, during July, we will take the opportunity to um, ask our community which services they value, which services they'd like more of, which services they'd like less of, and we'll use some of that data and insight to help inform those discussions that we have with you. And also, as we've mentioned previously and that Clinton has shared, um, through the business continuity that we underwent um, in the last few months, we have some really good data that we'll be able to share with you as well, just around how um, our essential services and mandated services operated during that period of time. And we'll use some of that data to help inform those workshops with you in July. Um, so just a reminder on the timeline, um, we're working to some really tight timeframes. Um, next week, oh, sorry, we're meeting with the audit committee on Friday just to run them through um, and get their input and feedback on what we're sharing with you tonight. Next Tuesday, as I've mentioned previously, we'd like to present you with an expenditure framework to enable us to um, make sure that projects um, and ongoing activities and fees and charges can um, take effect from the 1st of July. And then at the end of June, we're hoping to have a draft budget for you to consider for community consultation. So that's pretty much where we're at. Um, so just a recap from the 28th of May, we talked through the recovery principles and used those to underpin our approach to our financial management. We talked to you about rates and we heard um, pretty consistent feedback that there's a wish to continue to freeze the rate in the dollar, particularly um, at this period um, of time. And um, also options around a discretionary rate rebate. We're still doing some further work and modeling on that. Um, and we'll be able to share that with you um, before, um, is that next week, Alex, or on the 30th? It'll be next, next week, next week. Oh, sorry, for the 30th. Uh, we also have presented you with some proposed projects for next year and we were looking for your feedback on those. Those have been presented again tonight. Um, obviously, you'll be able to uh, make some uh, formal decisions on those next week. Um, fees and charges, what we'll be proposing to do, um, what we'll pre um, present to you next Tuesday is a proposal to hold the fees and charges at 1920 levels for at least the next six months, um, and then potentially consider any increase in those fees and charges from January 2021. Um, borrowing capacity, we've talked before about the importance of having some flexibility in borrowings. We were proposing um, to lift those borrowings quite substantially to enable council to take advantage of any stimulus funding that might be available either at the federal or state or better still both um, levels of government um, and as I made clear last time and I'll say again tonight just because your borrowing levels are at a high level doesn't necessarily mean you go out tomorrow and you borrow to the maximum capacity um, it's really important that any borrowings are done in the context um, either of investing in new revenue streams or to um, make sure that um, you're investing in city shaping projects um, tonight, also, Clinton will just run you through um, the infrastructure uh, programme um, and obviously um, continue that conversation around um, making sure that we're still um, doing our asset renewal programmes and taking risk-based approach with those. Um, and uh, Clinton will run you through an online demonstration as well of what that uh, looks like. So if we go to what's incorporated in the draft budget, Sorry, there's so much, and there's all this uh, lots Sorry. happening in front of me. Can members actually see these slides? Sorry, Chair, you're the only one I can see on no, the screen. No, on yeah, members I, see I the slides? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's very clear. People would have read it beforehand as well. Great, yes, I'm not proposing to read out. We, can we go to the next one? Sorry, we're on key movements. Great. So um, what we're seeing now for the 2020-2021 budget 
is significant reduction in our income and that's mainly from on street parking new park aquatic centre town hall mm -hmm. events um, along potentially with rent from our property tenants and we're um, estimating that to be in excess of 22 million in lost income and obviously as members will be aware from most of our um, other commercial businesses as well as our general operating we do have high level of fixed costs um, we have incorporated the 20 million dollar reduction operational expenditures at this point we actually don't know necessarily um, which services or which areas that will come from and as i said earlier we will work members through that um, in july and work through a framework to enable our members to make an informed decision um, and then um, in terms of the infrastructure program for, you know as clinton's described last time the focus really is on making sure we deliver um, as much as possible um, to get back on track in terms of being able to deliver um, a full infrastructure program um, in terms of how council funds that um, but members should also be where there's likely to be an increase in maintenance activities due to um, a reduction in the yield. so there are a couple of graphs there that show um, the impact of the um, operating surplus deficit with or without the 20 mil um, and what that looks like from a forecast borrowing's perspective um, and and Nicole will just run through that um, shortly as well as part of the long-term financial plan. So I'll just hand it over to Alex, who will go through in a bit more detail some of the numbers in relation to the operating. Thank you, Claire, and through the chair. Uh, so the overall operating position at this stage is a forecast deficit of $19 million, and that's before the potential restructural costs of 14 million. The deficit is primarily driven by the significant reduction in income uh, that we've talked about, $20 million compared to quarter two forecast. Uh, we have seen a reduction in operating expenditure of $25 million. Uh, that does include uh, <coughs> reduction in consultants and contractors, which are things that we've identified uh, through the draft budget as opportunities to uh, implement some uh, constraint on expenditure. Now, so this uh, slide just gives you the traditional uh, income ex expenditure perspective uh, to make things quite clear and simple. So the next slide uh, just provides an overview of how we fund the budget. And as we presented the budget back in, uh, or just back in December, we've simplified the presentation into three components, the operations, the projects, and the infrastructure. And so this just provides a summary of that. We have a net operating surplus of $23 million from the operations, which includes the general operations, the businesses, and also the what were previously considered projects and their activities have been transferred into operations that we've provided at the last meeting, and also the rolling renewal of plant, fleet, and equipment. So all the business as usual uh, aspects. Then we've got the projects, which are the strategic projects we presented uh, on the 28th, and then we've also got the commercial projects uh, which are predominantly the property developments. And then we've got the infrastructure program, which includes the renewals, the enhancements, and the, the major projects. So I'll just pause for a moment just to check if there's any questions uh, regarding those last two slides. Uh, we'll take all the questions at the end, Alex. So I'm sure members can make a note if they've got something Thank they can you. get back to the slides, but I'm keen to get through the presentation in full before we go to questions. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. So just move on to uh, slide nine. Now this is just uh, the breakdown of what is within the operations category. I'll take that as red. The next slide uh, presents a summary uh, by <coughs> the service categories. Uh, Claire, did you want to touch on uh, approach for the service categories? Um, so, back in October, we gave 
gave you uh, the full list of all our services um, with uh, detail around FTEs associated with um, each of those services, um, what the services delivered and any changes in those services over the last couple of years. What we're proposing to do um, for, to help the uh, community um, be able to help uh, provide input into which services they value. We've raised up the information to a bit of a higher level and we're proposing as part of the consultation um, just have a one pager that gives a bit more detail around um, you know, what arts, community development and civic services actually delivers so the community can have an informed um, view in terms of, um, of the services that they value. So that engagement um, is going to be the first time that we've asked our community in many, many years, what do they value? Um, and in terms of you know, what they don't value, obviously things like corporate support services, we all know that's a no brainer. I've made a commitment to members um, over the past few months to make sure that um, as part of um, any uh, uh, realignment or restructure or focus at the corporate services is certainly part of, of that. So asking the community do they value corporate support services, I'm pretty sure we can get a unanimous thumbs down. Um, and um, however, um, you know, it's still an important part of uh, the cost of doing business here at the City of Adelaide. So we feel it's important that we still um, provide that information. So. Um, We'll be able to, as I said earlier, provide this feedback as part of uh, the discussions that we have with you in July in terms of um, finding um, the uh, $20 million reduction. So we now just move on to a summary of the income for the operations. Uh, you'll see here the significant difference that we've had, uh, particularly in the draft budget compared to the quarter two forecast is a reduction in the user charges of about $16 million, that's a 37% reduction. That is predominantly due to uh, the reduction with the on-street parking, the U parks and the aquatic centre, uh, in addition to the reduction uh, in the rental income uh, from potential uh, vacancies that we've factored in. We then also have a significant reduction in the statutory charges, uh, which is $5 million or 27%, and that's predominantly due to a reduction from expiations. I'll just draw your attention to the assumptions. We're still working on approximately 3% for rates. Uh, there's 2% growth in new developments, 1% with the valuation uplift, with no increase or change in the rate in the dollar. And at this stage, we've assumed, uh, at least for the next six months, that the fees and charges uh, will remain held at the 2019-20 levels. The next slide just gives an overview of where we're at in terms of expenditure. Uh, <coughs> the key thing to just recognise here is that we've built in uh, increases in the enterprise agreements and the contractual increases that we have. Uh, we've made changes for the operations uh, due to COVID-19, uh, such as things like the increases in cleaning. And then um, where there have been uh, potential opportunities in the short term to have set savings that we've incorporated those in as well. Um, and the other aspect here is that we've worked on uh, interest rates being at about 1.5%. So I'll now hand over to Tom. I'll hand over to Tom to uh, talk you through the commercial slides. Good evening, members, and through you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, as you're well aware, the, the business operations, including property as well, are uh, certainly impacted because of COVID-19. Um, however, it is pleasing to note that restrictions are starting to be relaxed and in the not too foreseeable future, hopefully that will start to reap benefits in regards to the commercial operations. 
However, the important things to note from this slide is just to reflect effectively how revenue has been impacted. And if you look at the revised budget, you can see there's been a significant impact. Uh, those impacts are mainly felt within the Aquatic Centre and U Park, and naturally depending on Council's uh, recommendation and decision in regards to leases, that's where you're starting to see the majority of that impact. Just to give you an idea in regards to the operational challenges that we're currently facing, U Park in particular, uh, prior to the U uh, Park Plus, we were reflecting an 85% reduction in our uh, traffic or vehicular parking, um, which is absolutely significant for the U Park business. The, the main challenge was our casual parking, naturally with the no retail, uh, no restaurants, hospitality in general closed down and also offices as well. Uh, our casual parking was significantly down as was early bird and reserve parkers. Um, pleasing to say that the U Park uh, Plus uh, support package offered by council um, seen uh, effectively 10,000 uh, registrations on site and that certainly has assisted to stop that downward spiral in regards to revenue reduction but certainly also has assisted people coming back into the city. In regards to property, the biggest challenges we're going to be facing members is in September of this year where the JobKeepers Alliance will potentially be removed. We'll wait to see what happens with the federal government in regards to that. Why is that an impact? Well, effectively, a lot of our tenants and tenants around the city are relying on that JobKeepers uh, to actually engage with their workforce and to keep themselves operational. Um, there's also the challenges of recovering our debt, and that's debt prior to COVID-19, where effectively the businesses are saying that uh, they're financially uh, cash strapped, and uh, we're just working our way through to see how we can actually recover that debt in a responsible manner. Uh, there's reduced income from Central Market Arcade, um, and I think that's, that's important to note that whatever stimulus or or package council considers moving forward. It's important to note that during the redevelopment, which is targeted for, for May 2021, six months prior to that, we'll, we will be offering a 70% reduction on the base rent. So we just have to manage that from a timing perspective. Um, also, the other thing, it's really important to note um, that we haven't received any relief from banks or whatever as other landlords are starting to receive. So effectively, they, we're being hit directly on the bottom line through a waiver, not a deferral. And the other one is naturally we're getting a lot of requests, not only from small to medium sized enterprises, but from larger enterprises uh, who are actually impacted in regards to a, a reduction in business. And we're working that through in regards to what a deferral would look like in regards to rent relief for them. The aquatic uh, centre is uh, is uh, certainly challenging, um, and the COVID nineteen could probably not happen at a worse time during winter, where you typically see uh, uh, aquatic activity actually uh, drop to its lowest. Um, so we've stood down our casuals. We've certainly tried to keep our uh, full time and part time employees uh, gainfully employed, but that is challenging with no revenue. Um, as we we start to transition through this, uh, timing is important to us um, because naturally there would be a significant piece of our work is actually re-engaging with our customer base, which is both our members through our swim school and our members through our gym membership. Um, so we need to look at that. We also need to understand how COVID-19, not the numbers, but the four square meters actually impacts in regards to how we operate our business. And we believe that will have significant impact impact on swim school revenue, which is a substantial proportion of our <laughs> revenue. Um, and naturally, casual visitation, we're still waiting to understand what that really means. We believe that it will start to come back naturally. But again, as indicated earlier, it is one of those things during winter we see uh, less uh, casual swimmers coming in or less activation during that period. You would start to see it start to increase as we start to hit the warmer months. And lastly, just in regards to golf course, uh, pleasingly it is starting to recover. The relaxation in regards to golf course going from two golfers to four has certainly assisted, but uh, the realities are that the secondary spend is still impacted in regards to how we actually operate food and beverage and how that actually integrates back into the business. 
So effectively, what you're saying is a forecast non-favorable variance of U Park of 5.2 million. That's uh, based on prior to the previous year. Um, it is important to note up until the end of February of this year, all these businesses were actually uh, operating favorable to budget. Um, and we were traveling very, very well in relation to this. So the impacts of COVID is certainly significant. Um, so some of the things we'll be coming back to you to look at is it's certainly in regards to U Park Plus. The reason being is the majority of our car parks are starting to go full now, and that is due to U Park Plus, which is great. It served its purpose, um, but I think it's now time that we need to transition out of that. The Aquatic Centre naturally have indicated the challenges for us looking forward to the workforce, social distancing, and naturally the recovery in regards to enrolments. Golf course, uh, whilst it's minimal, it's, there's still challenges there. And the property, what we've based our current budget on is uh, no fee increase or no CPI indexation in regards to 2021. But we've also factored in a 20% vacancy rate. We're starting to see vacancies starting to come through where businesses, unfortunately, aren't able to come back. And naturally, that may be impacted uh, subject to council and any support packages they wish to move forward with. Thank you. Um, so I've included just a couple of slides, um, but I won't go through them. I think they're pretty self-explanatory, but I thought this one was interesting just around devices in the city and how we can start to see a bit more activity on the street. Um, in the last couple of weeks. So I'll just leave it at, the, at that for you. Um, so projects, um, there's a list there. We presented you um, the detail on the 28th of May um, and the full list of individual projects are at Appendix 3. So happy to leave that with you. Um, we've had a couple of questions from council members offline, but um, as I said, on the 28th of May, feel free to get in touch with the relevant directors. Um, we're happy to um, answer any questions on those projects. So I'll hand over to Clinton now, who'll just talk you through the infrastructure. Thank you, Claire. Um, thank you, members. Uh, I will just run through the next few slides um, relatively quickly. The information um, in the main has been presented previously. I've just added some context to some of the decisions that we are proposing um, to put forward to Council around um, the way we treat the Capital Works Program. And um, as I said, just to add to the context of some of those um, proposed actions that we're planning on taking. The first slide here just shows um, a revised long-term financial plan for infrastructure. This is not the full um, council long-term financial plan. This is just as it relates to our asset management plans and our predicted 10 year spend on infrastructure. As you can see, um, the current trend is lower than what we had predicted in, in our asset management plans, um, particularly um, from 1920 through to 2122 then we will see that we need to then um, increase our investment in assets, particularly around asset renewals, um, prioritising these asset renewals based on audit condition and risk. Um, you'll then note that our long-term financial plan sees us tracking um, along at a similar rate to the current long-term financial plan, taking into account um, the lower investment across the next two or three years. Um, and what council members may notice is this steep climb towards the end of the infrastructure long-term financial plan. Um, the explanation for that is that we are now starting to have to incorporate projects um, as listed down the bottom of the slide, such as Adelaide Bridge, the Torrens Weir structure, uh, replacement of Rundle U Park and Rymel Park Lake as some of those bigger investment projects that require our attention um, and council's attention in the in the future years of the long-term financial plan. Obviously, there are options for those um, investments. Um, something like the Adelaide Bridge project, you'll note that that has always also formed a part of our stimulus funding packages. So clearly, we would um, have a desire to either have that co 
funded or externally funded um, and not necessarily be a drain on council's budgets in the future. The asset sustainability ratio, I've presented information on the sustainability ratio in the past. Um, what this chart here just depicts is, again, the uh, last couple of years of asset sustainability ratios indicating that we have been operating um, just at or just under the recommended band of 90 to 110 percent. Um, we have done some modelling on what that sustainability ratio looks like in the next couple of financial years and then the dotted line predicts um, our, us tracking back to a position where we where we fall within that um, local government association target range of 90 to 110. Um, just based on the modelling that we have done, uh, even taking into account the lower asset sustainability ratio proposed for next year, um, we still believe we can get that 10-year um, average up around 90%, um, even taking into account some of the lower years in the next couple of years. Just to overview the infrastructure budget summary um, as the proposed <laughs> budget currently stands, um, the key column to look at is the column for the 2021 draft budget with the darker numbers. Um, and probably best to compare that to the third, sorry, the fourth column along the 1920 Q2 forecast. So the Q2 forecast um, predicts uh, where we were um, at the end of Q2 for 1920, and typically would be where we would finish um, without the impacts of COVID. So that's the number I like to refer to in terms of um, a benchmark against what our budget would have been for 1920. Um, as you can see, the 2021 budget. Um, across all um, categories is reduced. Um, and the one thing to note as well is that um, the 2090-20 retimed figure of $15 million has typically been a figure of about seven to $10 million each year. And that has been the figure that um, council would refer to as a carry forward figure that we've been delivering on each year. So if you look at the comparative um, budget for next year, versus the Q2 forecast of 58.8 million. We're forecasting um, or proposing a 41.3, but arguably it's 41.3 take 15 million. So it's actually 26.3 million. So as you can see, we're looking at really pairing back the infrastructure capital works budget for next year, really focusing on asset renewals and um, based on risk and condition and really focusing on the pure delivery and landing on the ground, those infrastructure projects that have um, carried forward into uh, this year and multiple years in the past. So now I will take you through a live demonstration of the infrastructure program as it currently stands for 2021. If you could just bear with me for 10 seconds, I'll just get this, um, system to work. You like to drive? <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, are we good? Okay, can everyone still hear me? Yes. Okay, so this um, here is a bit of technology that we haven't previously had. Um, we haven't had the ability to uh, show council um, live spatial data of our infrastructure program. So this has been a work in progress across the last 12 months. Um, it's something that our team have put a lot of work into. Um, not only do you see um, the dots on the page here that represent um, the work packages and projects that we have currently planned, um, there is also um, a whole backlog of information within the system that we can um, that we can update and we can model and we can prioritise um, to give council different views on, on the geographical spread of works, um, the dollar value of works, some of the key details around some of the projects and just have some ability to uh, visually represent um, the infrastructure program rather than presenting to you um, an Excel spreadsheet as such. So maybe if we go into, if I could get you, Vanessa, just to jump on to um, bridges. So selecting bridges, um, we go to a number of um, places on the page there and, and hovering over um, a particular spot on the map gives us a bit of information about some of the work we're planning on Adelaide Bridge, um, Victoria Bridge, Morford Bridge and University Footbridge. So this is to the value of $434,000 and it's just part of our renewal program. So general minor renewal works on our bridges. Maybe if we go to um, transport, Vanessa, if we can select transport. And again, are we able to get the list to come up on the side as well with the projects? Okay, so essentially we can hover over any of those um, projects and we can get the details of the project, um, where it is, um, what it's about, the scope of that project and the proposed budget for that project. So um, retimed projects, could we have a quick look at retimed as well? Just the last one that we'll look at, members. And again, this, this gives a good idea and a good snapshot of, again, the geographical spread of projects that we have proposed um, to be retimed and, and carried forward into 2021 as part of our budget for delivery next year. And again, um, the one that we've hovered over there is um, continuation of Field Street design. So there's budget allocated for the continuation of that design, um, as well as a number of other, of other projects there that are, that are listed. So um, happy to go through that in any more detail with any elected member that would like to see it. Um, happy to sit down and, and run through that and um, actually go through it in some more detail. So that's all I had on the infrastructure program and budget. Thank you. Great, thanks Clinton. Um, and now just quickly, I'll take um, those preliminary slides on the long-term financial plan as read, and I'll just ask Nicole to um, do the three different scenarios that um, we thought might be of interest to members. Um, obviously, we're mindful there may well be other multiple scenarios that you might want to explore. So similar to what Clinton's just said, um, it might be helpful if you just um, get in touch and we can always set up a separate session um, and, um, you know, uh, put those um, scenarios through the long term financial plan model. So I'll just hand over to Nicole. Yeah, can you just put that up on the screen? Is it on screen? No, it's towards the Hello. So we have, um, as taken read, so the draft long-term financial plan, we have the dashboard 
there, we have each of the new scenarios. So what might be worth showing is it on a graphical depiction. So from a borrowings perspective, each of the scenarios are shown. So you've got the prudential limit, which is in red. You've then got the draft long-term financial plan and then each of the two, the three scenarios. So scenario one is the long-term financial plan without the $20 million reduction to operating expenditure, which shows that we will breach uh, prudential limits across all years. Scenario two is the long-term financial plan with the long-term uh, infrastructure plan as adopted for 1920, noting the inclusion of the large expenditure in those outer years. We then have scenario three, which is incorporate the long-term financial plan with the impact of the draft bill for the rate relief. So borrowings we've got in that scenario, we then showing the impact on the operating surplus or deficit in this case. So it shows the impact of that over the four scenarios. We then have, again, on each of the dashboard, the impact across. Um, so we've got the net financial liabilities, which shows that for scenario one, we, and some of scenario three, we will be in breach with, of that ratio. The debt service coverage ratio, which again, in scenario one and three, we will be breaching that ratio and asset test ratio, we will be breaching in all scenarios through the long-term financial plan. Based on the draft long-term financial plan with the scenarios modeled as shown. Uh, any questions on any of that? Um, so the, the last section was um, the Treasury policy and borrowings. Um, so um, we've been uh, reworking our Treasury policy um, to reflect our current financial situation. Um, and in line with the recovery principles, we'll be presenting you with a revised um, borrowing policy to consider um, next week. Um, and what we're keen to do is get um, your feedback next week in terms of um, what that borrowing limit um, should potentially be. Um, as I mentioned on the 28th of May, um, I think at a level that enables council to invest in revenue generating assets or to take advantage of any stimulus funding um, will be an important consideration. Um, so that's pretty much it from us formally in terms of next steps you've seen and the time frame previously. Um, I'll, I'll hand back now to the uh, Chair, Deputy Law Mayor, to facilitate um, questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that very informative uh, discussion. I've got Councillor Martin first and then I saw the Lord Mayor's hand pop up as well. So. We'll go straight to you, Phil. Thank you. Look, uh, uh, this is the first time we've ever had the whole of the budget presented to us as one block over 40 minutes, and questions have been prohibited even when the slides ask for feedback. So can I just say I am finding this a bit unusual and discomforting. Um, there are many principles in there and statements uh, about which there ought to be some questions. Um, what, what is, if I can go back to principles, what is the future fund? Uh, who, who is running that? What's it look like? Where, where does it go? I, I haven't heard of this before. No? Okay, well, I'll go to something else if we can't answer that. Um, no, they're, they're coming, Councillor. Oh, okay. 
Sorry, yeah. Councillor Martin, but I had to wait for the host to unmute me, so I couldn't answer to this um, speaker. I know, I know the feeling. I know the feeling. I know, I know. I experience your pain. <laughs> The Future Fund, it's a, it's a new concept um, and um, it's in line with, um, you know, a, some, um, you know, progressive way of approaching um, how um, local government could manage um, their finances. So, um, for example, um, I, I shared with members some time ago um, something like the um, sale of the Grenfell street car park to enable Rundle Place to be redeveloped. That was a, a substantial um, uh, proceeds were received from that. And at the time, um, there were certainly discussions with the, that term of council that um, any proceeds should be used for revenue generating investment. Um, and what essentially happened was in the absence of being able to almost quarantine that funding, uh, the, um, the proceeds from that sale um, were um, in the end um, just used to pretty much come off the bottom line and went on um, doing um, public realm upgrades in a couple of different areas of the city, which the council at that time decided um, was a worthwhile investment. Um, so um, what we'd be recommending to council is that where there is a sale of either underperforming assets or um, any existing asset that there's an option for council if they choose to do it, um, to put that money to one side and to invest in something um, that, that generates tangible uh, return on investment. That's what the proposal is. But obviously, um, you know, through the work that Tom has led on the uh, review of our strategic property, um, all that will be done in the full um, transparency uh, with council. So that's the intent. It is a new concept, um, but certainly um, it's something that I'll be encouraging members to consider. From a financially sustainable okay. perspective. All right. So it's not a it's not a fully formed thing yet. Okay, I get that. Um, we say also as a principle, strategic enhancements will be delivered through partnerships. Why don't we say um, uh, where possible, uh, restricting the strategic enhancements to delivery only through partnership would seem to me to be a bit limiting. Um, yes, so that's um, up to members to absolutely um, build as much flexibility into those um, principles if they so wish. Um, I think uh, one of the um, challenges around the enhancements is um, sometimes, um, you know, there's an opportunity that's gifted to council around um, enhancements. So, for example, or the Quentin Keenaham Playground's a great example where um, that's obviously a partnership with government. Uh, the costs for that project are probably more than what anyone anticipated when the Premier announced that project during the caretaker period of the last local government election. And so um, what was seen at that point in time as a million dollar project now, I think heading towards three. Um, and so, um, you know, where, where appropriate, um, I think uh, it would be sensible to make sure that uh, there's a partnership approach taken to some of these um, enhancement projects but sure if members feel that there needs to be more flexibility in that wording then yeah that's up to members well i mean it, it would it would prevent us from doing substantial developments like crawl place redevelopment if it was a, um, a partnership because that wasn't that was just a straight in enhancement funded by council but anyway i take your point um can i ask uh, this uh, one-off $14 million structural realignment. What, what, what's under consideration? What, what is part of that $14 million? Just a deferral of capital works? Uh, no, that's an amount that's been set aside. So, um, so if there is um, to be any um, service reviews that, um, as I've said previously, all of our services are mainly delivered by people, there will be need to set aside um, costs associated with any downgrading or change in those services, unless it's a service that actually has no people attached to it, such as, you know, um, things like 
uh, what's top of mind, connector bus. So something like the connector bus um, doesn't have, you know, six FTE involved. So um, the, um, what we need to do to, is make sure that there's an appropriate allocation, but this will be worked through with council members in July. Okay, so look, uh, just on the basis of the information supplied to make sure that I'm not double counting, is it proposed in 2021 that there will be a $20 million reduction in operational spending, a one-off $14 million structural realignment cost, and a $23 million reduction in our previous infrastructure spending? Um, is that about right, about 57? That's about right, yes. And obviously that depends on how we go with um, working through this in July lie with me that's, so uh, that means, you know it may well you may well find that you can find 30 million dollars um, of savings or it may well be 10 million dollars so that bit we it's still unknown I'm sorry, no, no, I'm, sorry Alex does want to just clarify something councillor yes so just one point of clarification uh, we have sorry we have a 20 million dollars reduction in operational expenditure and we have a circa 20 million dollar reduction in the infrastructure program so that comes to about 40 by 40 million dollars and yep. then <coughs> offsetting that is 14 million dollars once off potential uh, expenditure so the net of that is a, about 27 28 million dollars okay and that's to offset a, um, a pandemic-related reduction uh, in revenue of around about 20 million, is that correct? Uh, that's predominantly the driver for uh, the current financial position, but obviously uh, that is offset in part by the infrastructure. Uh, but as we've talked about today, we've got a significant reduction in excess of $20 million in our operating income. If you compare to our quarter two position, it's a $26 million reduction next financial year in our operating income. Okay. Um, uh, look, I, I must say I, some of the, um, uh, the calculations are, are a bit troubling and I'm wondering whether they're old ones. I know, for example, at, at the risk of inviting Tom to enter the discussion again, I noticed that um, in, in terms of the aquatic centre, it's argued that we're going to have social distancing that goes through until February 21, which will impact on income levels, um, when all the evidence seems to be that uh, social distancing, distancing is breaking down. Restaurants, hotels, aircraft, public transport, football matches, and yet these calculations are all based on people being four metres apart at the aquatic centre. Now, has that not changed a bit? And would that not then uh, impact substantially on a forecast $2.1 million debt? Or, sorry, um, uh, loss? I'm sorry, it's a very good question, but as I highlighted uh, through the three slides, at the minute, the uncertainty is around the four square metres. Four square metres has a significant significant impact in regards to how we operate swim school, for example. Um, naturally, we have a lot of children in a water space, and if you were to apply four square metres, that would actually limit the amount of uh, classes. It would also limit the amount of participants, which would end up reducing our revenue significantly. Um, the, the other unknowns also is how that flows on simple things like changing rooms. Um, whilst the, the government has been very uh, explicit in regards to numbers, it hasn't talked about how people actually interact and where, where they actually get changed, because changing rooms was a, certainly out of this equation to start with. Also, the limitations in regards to lane space and also the limitations in regards to gymnasium. But what I did say is, naturally, what we're trying to do is predict what we know now and a little bit of forward casting. Um, uh, God forbid that uh, we have a, have a second wave or restrictions aren't removed. The other thing that we need to be clearly mindful, especially in the aquatic centre, is that uh, there may be a significant amount of resistance from parents and from schools in regards to coming back into a facility where you have large volumes of numbers of people. 
and we're trying to take that into account how we can factor that in. Um, so look, what I'm saying is this is quite unique to us. We've based the figures that we have based on what we know. Um, it's the unknowns. Can it improve? Yes. What that looks like, we don't know. Simple as that. All right. Look, I, I just find it extraordinary that we're extrapolating standards through to February when in fact it's changing almost weekly um, and then expecting that there's going to be a loss. Um, Chair, I, I have a number of questions related to specific projects. I will take those uh, offline since that seems to be the preference for this council to talk behind closed doors. Um, but if I might just make one observation, and that is that the administration has helpfully provided us for the chart demonstrating how well that we've assisted with the pandemic result um, it, with a $4 million um, incentive package and just ask members to go and have a look for themselves and see what other cities are doing. Um, we are in fact the most miserly city in Australia when it comes to uh, pandemic relief. Um, Hobart does better than us. $3.5 million was the package from the city of Hobart. Uh, city of Sydney, um, 70, 80, 100 million dollars on various projects. Melbourne, um, 41 million dollars on transport alone. Uh, it goes on and on. Uh, ours is a, a miserly approach and we ought to be able to do better and I do hope that the administration will come to us with a package uh, that will help small business. But I must say that uh, overall what this amounts to is big cuts in council spending uh, rather than a reduction that's required to meet uh, pandemic costs or losses. Uh, we still are forecasting large deficits, uh, debt until the end of the decade, ballooning out to well over $100 million and perhaps to $150 million by the end of the decade. Uh, cuts to infrastructure, which are going to lead to duplication uh, through works on things that ought to be um, redone. I know we're spending $4 million almost on the Rundle Street uh, U Park and our uh, administration tells us at page 26, I think it is, uh, or 29, that we're going to have to write that off by the end of the decade. There's an absolute reliance on other governments for funding at a time when councils all over Australia, including Melbourne, Sydney and so on, are spending to stimulate. We are actually pulling back. And we're not only pulling back cutting services and infrastructure and just doing maintenance, but at the same time, we're cutting community programs like the City Connector. I mean, this is a really harsh budget. Um, were this occurring in Canberra Chair, where you are uh, tonight, um, there would be a bun fight in the corridor. They would be slinging fists at each other. This is a really, really serious drop in activity from the City of Adelaide. Thanks, Councillor Martin. And just to correct the record, this is a workshop to see what our budget might look like. And this is the start of the process. We haven't cut anything yet. Um, our council has asked the administration to find $20 million in operational savings, um, which uh, is in part due to the pandemic. And is also in part, as you've pointed out, because we've been running deficits uh, for the last couple of years, deficits which you as well have presided over and pointed out then also. So um, uh, with that, I'll just ask Claire, was there anything in that, um, uh, uh, I was gonna use another word, is there anything in that, uh, in that response from, uh, from Councillor Martin that you uh, felt the need to clarify before we move on? Um, it's up to I, you, I'm keen to keep I, things moving though. I mean, is it is it helpful? Um, what I would no, it's probably not going to achieve anything. That's okay. Uh, Councillor Mackey. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, firstly, uh, to the CEO and um, senior management, thank you for the legibility of this PowerPoint presentation. Uh, if I look back, and granted, I'm looking back 17 years to the kind of information that was provided to elected members to help inform the shaping of the budget. This is this is really, really very helpful, so thank you. Um, first, I've got three questions. First one you, you might need to take on notice. Um, do you know, in regard to the um, asset sustainability ratio that uh, Clinton um, presented on um, earlier, 
and the LGA target of 90 to 110 percent. Do, do you know by chance what the SA government target range is for, um, uh, for asset sustainability? No, so we, we benchmark with local government, so um, we can certainly follow up for you, Kat. I'd be, I'd, I'd be very grateful, thank you, thank you. Um, my um, second question, uh, what, and as a newcomer, what policy room does the long-term financial plan uh, asset divestment reinvestment approach um, uh, have, uh, what capacity does it have to retire other existing asset related debt? So are you talking about underperforming assets in relation to assets that count for loans? Uh, uh, sorry, no clear. Um, what I'm uh, referring to um, is we have a book of, um, of debt, uh, uh, loan borrowings that we've made as a, as a city, uh, ostensibly, perhaps with the exception of the last couple of years, ostensibly uh, 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 tied to the acquisition or de uh, redevelopment of assets. Um, I'm interested to know whether in the long-term financial plan, if we were, for example, to retire an underperforming asset tomorrow, um, is there the potential for the sale of that asset to act rather than to go into a bank to buy new assets, but to actually retire other uh, debt on productive assets that we've already got on the books? Yes, yeah, absolutely. So that's tended to be the approach So where council makes a decision to sell an asset and use that. Um, uh, thank you. And, and look, my last question kind of relates to this. Would it be possible uh, for elected members to receive a summary? Uh, and you may, others may already have this. Uh, it's simply my, my newcomerness, uh, uh, newcomer status. Uh, a summary of existing council debt or borrowings, um, the terms and repayment schedule uh, for those, uh, those loans and the assets against which those loans have been raised. I think it would be helpful to get a, a full picture of um, that aspect of, of our duty of uh, our due diligence and duty of care uh, to yeah, the financial yes. performance. Yes, councillor, we can provide you. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. That would be very interesting, Greg, because um, I don't think anyone else has seen that uh, either. Um, uh, we'll go to the Lord Mayor because, uh, Sandy, your hand was uh, second and I skipped you. Um, thank you. Um, I would like to say uh, a, a thank you for the amount of work that's gone into this and also the scenario planning. So it was great to actually be able to have a look at some of those scenarios so that we understand um, what the impact is of some of the decisions we may make um, in the next little bit. I've got a few questions. Um, they might not be in order. Um, I was interested that on page 16, we talked about mid late June social distancing measures expecting to be relaxed because I've yet to hear that they are going to be relaxed. So, um, so I wouldn't really be looking uh, at that too quickly. Um, in terms of other capital city support, it's something that's been discussed uh, by Triple CLM uh, over the last few months. Um, a lot of it is is in relation to their budget. I mean, of course, you know the budgets of Melbourne and Sydney are quite different. Brisbane's got three billion dollars, so our budgets are relative. What we can actually do in terms of support packages is relative to our budget, um, and that table on uh, page. 18 gives you a fair indication. Uh, I would note that uh, whereas Adelaide has no outdoor dining fees, part of the packages in um, some of the other capital cities is that they've waived their outdoor dining fees. Uh, not that they don't normally charge them, but they've waived them as part of their city support. Um, the options on page 20 uh, in terms of providing additional assistance um, I would like us to explore providing longer term assistance uh, for longer term repayment period where it is an amortisation of rates as opposed to a, a strict deferral. So rather than that, you know, not being paid on the 30th of June gets paid on the 30th of August, 
um, I'd be very keen for us to look at a scenario where we can actually amortise the rates over a greater period of time. Um, and yes, if they have up to two years or even more, depending on how, um, how long we're going through this. Um, and the other thing I would be keen to do is have a look at uh, very targeted support packages for the industry sectors that are the most affected, uh, noting that you've actually called out hotels with and without accommodation. Um, but I, I'm very keen to see what that would do in terms of our long-term financial plan as well. Um, in terms of the um, asset renewals, um, I'd be very keen for us, Clinton, I'm not sure whether you're going to bring this in, but I'd really be keen to see the condition audits for each of the asset classes. Um, I don't think that we have. And, and I'd also be keen to understand what the service levels are. So, um, you know, we, we have discussions about everything that we do it has to be sort of gilded or gold leafed. I'd be very keen if we can actually have a conversation around the asset class and also the level of, uh, or the service level that we feel comfortable as a council. So there might be things that we uh, ask our community whether we could look at a, a, a you know, we might be doing a low service level that we should be doing medium or a high service level that we should be doing a, a lower service level on those. Um, and I, I uh, noting that there's a reduction in 23 million, I do actually think given that we've had not many, many years of having carry forwards, which have been uh, really clearly showing that we don't have the capacity to deliver on what's been funded, um, that I think to bring us back to a zero base would be uh, a really excellent way to fund within our capacity to deliver and then uh, almost a zero base and then starting from there so that we can actually uh, deliver on all the projects that are in the schedule. Uh, and so if we can address that, I'd also be keen to see the... Um, in the long-term financial plan on page 24, uh, there's a, obviously a significant spike in the outer years around renewals, but we don't really have a lot of information as to is the Adelaide Bridge a $10 million project or is it a $60 million project? And um, because I've heard everything in between those two figures. So uh, I'd be keen to actually understand whether we're actually looking at um, a... Uh, uh, renewal or an enhancement or um, how, how we're actually looking at each of those things um, uh, going forward. Um, what was the other one that I had? Um, I think that's probably it for now. I'll come back if I, if I have any others. Um, I'll come back if I've got any others. Thank you. See you later. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Uh, Councillor Kira. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks. Um, look, um, I'm just looking at page uh, 12 of the uh, materials, um, and we've got the operational expenditure by category, um, and it, there's, a, there's a graph there with expenditure over the years. Now, the increase... Uh, in employee costs from uh, 27.18 uh, till now is, uh, it goes from $79 million to $91 million. My calculation is that that's an increase uh, of uh, 15% uh, or 5% uh, per year. Um, can it be said that we have had an increase in the amount of service uh, provision uh, to the tune of 5% per year for the past three years? Yeah, no, I just <clears throat> uh, can I just take that one on notice, and I'll come back with a response uh, just to sure. clarify okay. what's on, on there. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Um, look, I'll just say that presumably there have been some efficiency gains along the way, uh, which really should uh, should see an even lower figure than that um, along the way. But look. Um, I'll leave the rest, rest of my queries. I'll, 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 I'll put those uh, offline. 
Um, I think I'll just at this stage reiterate that uh, the need uh, is imperative now uh, more than ever before uh, to focus on core business uh, and to see through a process which will deliver a significant uh, and lasting long-term savings uh, 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 savings to ratepayers and, and to the local economy. Okay, so I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, members, I don't see any other hands up. No, and I guess that um, speaks to how clear the presentation was. So I just want to thank you and your team, Claire, because I think these um, the updated manner in which we're receiving this information is really, really valuable. Um, I did have a couple of questions. How easy is it to get the slides back up? And um, I'll actually, I guess you've got them in front of them and members would have as well. Um, uh, just looking at the infrastructure one, um, and this may be a question for either you guys or Clinton, um, just in 21-22, there's a jump of, oh, well, a jump in the tens of millions. Um, and then there's another jump in the um, uh, tens of millions in 27-28. Um, could you just detail what those, what those jumps are? Thanks, Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, the, certainly the jump in the 27 to 28 outward years um, is just referenced on the slide there just around, and again to the Lord Mayor's question around the value of some of those uh, future investments. Um, so I can come back to you with the detail around the value of those particular investments, but they do yeah, relate I'm to just, Adelaide I'm Bridge. Just wondering like how much you're expecting, yeah, just wondering how much you're expecting for yep. these bridges, because as the Lord Mayor, I, I can detail the estimates. For you. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. And if you could, yep. if you could detail what sort of infrastructure work it is, that would be good. Um, sure. Uh, um, well. I can explain the the um, the steepness in the graph around twenty one, twenty two, through to twenty two, twenty three. If you like that, that really relates to a bit of a backlog of asset renewals. So what we've found in the previous few years is an underinvestment in asset renewals as a result of undertaking some of those upgrades and enhancements, um, together with um, next year focusing on um, delivery. Uh, what we need to do is revert our thinking back towards asset renewal. So there's a focus on asset renewals in 21, 22 to 22, 23, which would require us to invest more. Um, also, in the next, uh, within the next six months, we'll have all of that condition audit um, information that the Lord Mayor referred to, and also we'll be presenting the strategic asset management plan and, and the individual asset management plans for each of those asset categories, and we'll be able to step through what that future investment looks like. At this point in time, that, that's the information that we have based on um, the current status of um, our asset management plans. So, so, so what you're saying is I'm looking at it and it looks to be about, um, what is that? 25 million. So the, the, the crux of it is, and this isn't accusatorial in any way, but despite all the, the enhancements that we've been doing, such as, you know, Bank Street, or well, just Market River Bank generally, Gawler Place and what have you, our renewals are behind to the tune of about 25 mil. Is that? Uh, typically... It, it depends what's depicted in the long-term financial plan as it currently stands, Deputy Lord Mayor. So I don't know whether it's 25 million, but typically we have been running at lower sustainability ratios. So what that means is if our sustainability, if our long-term financial plan has suggested an investment of 33 million and we haven't invested that 33 million, then that actually aggregates over the years. So in other words, it creates a bit of a bow wave um, that we do have to manage in the in the future years for the long term financial plan. So I think you'll find that's that's what that is a culmination of um, several years of of not running at that one hundred percent investment. Yeah, and has um, uh, the uh, the new software and uh, systems that you guys have been putting in place over the last year um, has that helped identify some of these things, or is this is this purely a sort of 
numbers on a page exercise. So has that software helped you identify things that do need to be renewed? And that's part of what's incorporated here? Uh, what it's allowed to, us to do is definitely get a higher level of accuracy with the figures that we're working with, absolutely. Um, the system that we're working with does rely on the condition audits. So as I said, the condition audits are currently being undertaken and will be presented through the asset management plans. Um, it's not only the condition of the asset that is um, that dictates the required investment, it's also the age of that asset, um, the ability for us to find the optimal time to upgrade that asset. So depending on risk, um, footpaths may carry a slightly higher risk, say, than some other form of um, infrastructure like a, a light pole. So there's an ability for us to manage that through the asset management plans. Um, the system will enable us to um, do some predictive modelling such that if council wanted to look at a different way to manage its investment in the future, we can actually model that and come back to you um, with what that can look like in terms of a 10-year long-term financial plan. Mm. Okay, thank you, Clinton. Um, uh, I had a further question, probably not, yes, for you, Claire. Um, uh, just on 12, when we're looking at the uh, summary of services, um, I don't know if you can bring that one up for members, slide 12 or page 12. Uh, which is on your slide pack is 10, I think, actually. Yeah, I was just um, like, that's, that's, that's quite clear. And that's, that's a lot of detail. And I think that's more detail than has ever been given to the public from what I can tell in our annual reports. Um, so thank you. I was just wondering, uh, out of this, um, could you sort of, for um, our benefit, uh, particularly regulatory and statutory services um, and also policy and planning services. Um, could you go into a bit of detail as to what those are, just sort of headlines? Uh, now? Uh, yeah, yeah. For, for example, policy and planning, you know. Policy and planning picks up things like um, parklands um, work, so uh, the team that supports um, the uh, APLA. Um, it also picks up um, heritage management. Um, it picks up the city plan work, um, the spatial planning. Um, it picks up things like transport planning as well. Um, our community engagement team also sits within that. Um, and also the um, city insights and strategy teams as well. So um, as I said, when we um, when this slide was presented, we'll have a one pager that actually um, gives a bit more sort of clarity to the community to help them understand what's sitting within these these categories. Yeah. Okay. And that and that was that was part of my question. So I'm assuming things that that by law we are required to undertake, such as planning in a, in a regulatory sense across the city. That's actually in regulatory and statutory services, for example. That's right. So regulatory. And statutory services are those that are mandated by legislation for us to deliver. So that is things like, actually includes things like our customer centre as well, where we are mandated by legislation to have a customer centre. Um, environmental health, financial planning, um, planning assessment, building assessment, building compliance. Um, and one of the things we, you know, we want to work through with council is, although we're required to deliver these services and we are mandated to deliver these services, there's still discretion in terms of the, um, how those services are delivered. So, um, yeah, but we'll, but we'll have one pages for each of these categories. Yeah, thank you. And just, just one last one, um, waste. Obviously, by law, we're required to, to, to be picking up bins or to facilitate the picking up of those bins. That's in the bottom category with 17 FTE. Is that a different sort of waste we're talking about there? Is that, is that more of a sustainability focus and, and is the actual requirement to collect people's rubbish in the regulatory and statutory services? Oh, good question. I might need to take that on notice. Yeah, Some okay. of them may no well be sitting in, um, under cleansing. Yeah. Under, yeah. yeah, different yeah. part of the... Okay. Yeah, asset maintenance, yeah. Right, got you. All right. Okay, that's it from me for the moment. Councillor Martin, just a quick point, I hope. 
Uh, yes, look, it was just a, a question uh, that I uh, was wondering about, uh, and perhaps Claire can provide a, uh, a quick response. Um, Melbourne and Coll Street master plans, which includes Hutt Street, has been reduced from 370 to 232. What, why is that? Yeah, so I think that's a carry forward from 1920. So that would have money would have already been spent. So the bit that's missing from that would have already been spent uh, for this current financial year. And so what's oh, left is the carry forward. And uh, why are we, without that Hutt Street master plan, allocating $325,000, which is considerably more than the master plans, for expenditure on Hutt Street that amounts to master planning sort of stuff, urges, trees, greening, all of those sorts of things. Why are we not waiting for the master plan? So, so which project are you looking at? Can you, can you draw me to the slide? Is that which attachment? Yeah, uh, page 52. 52, let me just have a look. So I think I think that was part of the renewals program, Councillor Martin. So. But, uh, yeah, but I guess my question is, why are we doing structural change, verges, greening, uh, garden beds, all of that sort of stuff, three hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars worth, in the absence of a master plan? It's sort of like you know, um, let's spend the money and then we'll do a master plan. Um, no, so I think um, there's been a couple of discussions that have been had and led by Shanti um, in that where there's funding already available such as through um, either asset renewals or through things like splash or activation. What we've tried to do is align some of that funding uh, to those three main streets, whether it's Melbourne Street, O'Connell Street and Hutt Street. So there would have been existing funding already um, through the renewal or the asset maintenance program to do work on Hutt Street. Um, and then what we've done is made sure that um, we get um, you know, better bang for buck by making sure other programs that, that council runs is, um, is uh, focused on those three streets. Oh, Does that make okay, sense? thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, look, thrilling news from Melbourne and Cobb. Um, um, and which you know we've talked previously or this council has where um, there may well be a master plan developed that takes two or three years then um, you know that can provide a good sort of 10 year view um, in terms of what needs to happen over the longer term but I think the feedback from council was they wanted us to get on and do some quick wins and prioritize that as, um, as a priority. Thank you. Good news for Melbourne and O'Connor Streets. Thank you. Thank you, CEO. I see your hand up there. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I just wanted to say um, it's clear that this budget process has required a different approach because of the circumstances that we're in. And um, Claire and the finance team have done a lot of work to really reset our approach to budgeting, to reset our approach to reporting to you and reset the approach to making things clear, simple and logical. And I think that's been a really good piece of work. Um, it's a really significant amount of um, effort that's gone into responding to the impacts of COVID-19 and also to the deficit trend over the last few years. So there is no doubt that we have a challenge, um, but I think that the roadmap that's been laid out to you today like Claire and the team, really sets the way forward. Um, and I think there is a fair bit for you to absorb. And I encourage any, any members tonight that if you have any questions, to approach Claire and the team um, to get clarity over that so that when you come to the meeting on Tuesday the 30th of June, um, you can make an informed decision about whether to go to public consultation. So that is the invite. There'll be a number of touch points before then, but I can only encourage you during this time um, to reach out to the staff and to and to work with us on any concerns or any queries or any suggestions you have so that when we go to the 30th of June you can make informed decisions. I think that's really important. Uh, thanks Chair. Uh, thank you Mark and thank you for your leadership in this very trying time. Um, thank you everyone for your attendance. I uh, will declare uh, the meeting closed.
Okay.